one of the greatest evangelists and missionaries of the first century was the Apostle Paul. And he went around to many different cities and areas preaching the gospel, but he also had opportunities to write letters. Now, sometimes he was in prison, and if you could imagine the frustration of that, you kind of want to be free to be able to go out and teach and preach and win some more people and encourage the Christians, and here you are stuck in a dungeon. And sometimes there were opportunities for him to, while he spent the days there, what am I going to do? Well, maybe I could write a letter. And aren't you glad that he wrote some letters? Because many of the letters and books that we have in the New Testament were written by Paul. Other times he was writing perhaps to churches as he was anticipating a visit. And that's what we're looking at today in Romans. It's a letter that he writes to a church he'd never been to yet, wanted to go and visit, but he thought he would encourage them. And what he does at some point, in chapter 6 where the reading came from, is talk about their life in Christ and what that would mean and what that looks like. So we're used to sometimes talking about being born, what it means to be alive, to be in this world, to be somebody who's living and breathing and active and functioning and relationships and all the things that go into being alive. Now Jesus is the one who really initially talked about being born again. Everyone's got a first birth, but the question is what about the second birth? And in John chapter 3, he's talking to a very religious man, Nicodemus. And Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and wanted to talk about some great things. And Jesus said, well, let's get some, uh, some things out of the way first. Let's just talk about being born again. And so he said to Nicodemus, you must be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says, I don't really understand what you're saying. I'll put it in modern day terms. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, can I get in my mom's womb again? Be bo- like, what do you mean, born again? What does this mean? So Jesus explained it to be born again means being born of water and the spirit. Being born of water and the spirit. And if you're born of water and the spirit, you will not only see the kingdom of heaven. It says you will enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's very important to understand, well, what does this mean? What does this mean? So by the time we get to Romans chapter 6, Paul's trying to help the church understand what a new life in Christ looks like. So this is basically when we talk about things like being born again or being born of water and the Spirit, or today we'd also use the word baptism, of what it means to be born of water and the Spirit, baptism. So in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we've got Jesus teaching a little bit about what it means to be baptized. And then in the book of Acts, we have examples of people being baptized. And after the book of Acts, there's not so much teaching about what what to do in order to become a Christian by being baptized. It's kind of like, because he's writing to Christians. You have been baptized. We say, what does that mean? What difference did that make in my life? And that's what he's going to be doing in Romans. Let's talk about your baptism. So just to maybe get a little bit of a context of what baptism really is. Because some people say, I'm not even sure if the Bible really talks about baptism that much. Well, you might be thinking that, but you also just might be a little bit wrong. Well, that's okay. I've been wrong before. But let me give you some scriptures on baptism. So I'm not going to tell you where these are found. I've put them together. It's not like a really co- coherent story, but it's the story, I would say, of baptism. So the scriptures will appear on the screen of where it's taken from, but you're going to have to look at that yourself because I'm just going to read these through. We'll begin in Mark chapter 1. John the baptizer appeared. He was preparing the way of the Lord, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And when Jesus was baptized by John, Immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove coming to rest on him, and a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you are born of water and the Spirit, 
you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Well, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe or obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. But when the people of Samaria believed Philip as he was preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said to Philip, See, look, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. They both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And Peter commanded them to be baptized in the name of of Jesus Christ. And Paul and Silas spoke the word of the Lord to the jailer at Philippi and to all those who were in his house. And the jailer took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all of his family. And John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And Ananias said to Paul, And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. You see, God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight people, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which now corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For in one spirit, we're all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of the one spirit. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. Having been buried with Christ in baptism, in which you were raised with him through faith, in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. For as many as you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Well, I ran out of room. There could be more. I think I've, maybe we could say hit the highlights, perhaps. But back to Romans chapter 6. We have a problem with the church. The problem really comes from Romans chapter 5. And the people were saying, when I sin, there's forgiveness. There's grace. God is willing to be merciful. So, why shouldn't I just continue to sin? Because I sin more, I get more grace. So why would I stop sinning? What, what would be the motivation? What would be the benefit? Especially if I enjoy sin. Seems fun for a while. And if it's all wiped clean and forgotten and erased and I'm still going to go to heaven. So 
Paul, perhaps anticipating that may be a question they have, as he's been talking about salvation through faith and grace in Christ Jesus, he says, well, let's talk about something then. If you're in Christ, let's talk about that. What shall we say? Shall we continue in sin? He's like, no, don't. Absolutely not. Well, why? Can you explain something? So oftentimes, you know, when we do what's called preaching the gospel, we try to explain to people what baptism is for. And here, Paul is going to say, well, you've already been baptized because you're Christians. But let's talk about what baptism is for. And so he's going to bring some things to mind. So he's going to ask a, what we would call a rhetorical question. They, they already know what the answer is. It's, it's not that difficult, right? How can we who have died to sin still live in it? What do you mean died to sin? What does that mean? I don't remember. Do you remember doing that? Dying to sin? We saying, well, yeah, you did die to sin. You said, I no longer want to sin. I no longer want to live in sin. I, don't, I no longer want to commit to sin. I, I, I want to be free from sin. He's saying, well, you've died to sin. Don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So, that, so something happened when I was baptized. Right? So people know what's baptism for. So it, it's really powerful explaining in great detail about this baptism. He's reminding them something they already knew. I don't think this is... This is not something where we tell people, listen, just get baptized, we'll tell you everything later. Right? Because that's not the way you teach people. Like, basically, I'd say, that's not the way you do business. That's like, that's like somebody coming to you and saying, here, I've got this contract. You don't need to read it. Just sign it. Oh, okay. I'll just sign it then. We'll explain it later. Like in court when we take, because we're taking everything away from you. You know, it's like, no, you want to know what is this all about. It's kind of like getting married. It's not a half bad idea for people that are planning on getting married to actually know what they're actually doing. Because a lot of people are like, well, I'm just in love. Love's going to carry me through. Right? Everybody good on that? Yeah, yeah. Right? Well, there's a little bit more to it than just this uh, ooey feeling I got going in my tummy about this person I want to marry. Right? It's a commitment. You know, there's going to be some, some things you're going to have to stick with. There's going to be some challenge, you know. So there's going to be some ups and downs, you know. And that's even in, technically, even in the vows we make when people get married, you know. The richer, poorer, sickness, health, till death do us part. It's a pretty serious commitment. And that's the same thing with baptism. You're saying, I'm going to commit my life to the Lord. Now, another word that we would use, is not even mentioned in Romans 6, but a word would be repentance. Right? To say, I'm no longer going to be living for the world. I'm going to be committed to Jesus. Kind of like when you get married. Right? This is the ideal of marriage, by the way, guys. And women too, but I'll talk to the guys. You know, you're saying, I'm going to be committed to you. Right? I'm not going to be committed to other women, which even includes my mother, or my sister, or my ex-girlfriend, or a girl I'm going to meet in the future. I'm going to be committed to you, to you alone, till death do us part. It's me and you. That's it. Right? Commitment. And that's what he's saying. When you became a Christian, you made a commitment to Jesus. Well, what was your commitment? You said, I'm not going to be living for the world anymore. I'm not going to be living for sin anymore. So that's kind of why he's saying, what do you mean you're a Christian now and you're going to continue to sin? Guys, try that sometime on your wife. Well, I know we're married. I know I made the commitment, you know, but I'm thinking about seeing some other women sometimes. That's not going to last very long. Like three seconds, and then it's over. Like one way or the other, it's over, right? Because that's not the commitment you made. Right? So this is what he's reminding them. Christians. So this is kind of where it gets really practical for us, because maybe when we started, you thought, oh, he's going to tell us this little thing about baptism and tell all these, these heathen, non-Christians, what they need to do and other 
you know, to be committed to Jesus. What's all Paul's doing here? He's just, he's trying to remind them of something they've already done, saying, what, are you going back on your vows now? Oh, we continue to live in sin, the grace may increase. Because I know my, my honey bun, you know, she's going she gonna to forgive me. Just that kind of woman. No, right? That's not what the commitment's about, right? So we died to sin. When did we die to sin? When we were baptized. And I know there's people that sometimes in, in kind of the religious circles, they say, well, baptism is not that big of a deal. You know, you take it or leave it. You know, it's just water. Right? So, and by the way, baptism is not a work. Right? Like, if, if you here have been baptized and you feel like that you worked hard at your baptism, raise your hand. Now, sometimes if you baptize somebody, you're doing them work here. you got to pull them back up again. Right? But, see, baptism is not a work. Baptism is like a marriage ceremony. I mean, I don't want to ask that question. How many people felt like their, their wedding was work? You know, it's like, <laughs> I'm going to put my hand. You know, a lot of guys may be like, mm, no, better not. It's not work. We're not working for something. We're joining into a covenant. We're getting into a relationship. We're becoming one with Christ. So, did we die with Christ when we were baptized? That's a hard question. That, just a couple things, just side note, right? I know sometimes people are like, well, how young can a child be? You know, and I know it, it, ages are quite differently. I mean, if I was going to wait till I was mature to get baptized, 36 maybe or something. I don't know. It's just not going to happen, right? Still not sure if I, uh, no, okay. So yeah, how young? But then the other question is, what does one need to know before they're baptized? So I'll give you an illustration. I grew, my parents became Christians, kind of were introduced to the church. They did Bible studies, became Christians when I was about eight years old. So I didn't kind of have all the history in the church. But I knew when I was about 10 or 11 years old that I wanted to get baptized. Okay? The reason I was baptized is, back in my mind, I knew I did not want to go to hell. Secondly, my friends were getting baptized. I wanted to join the club. Like, you know, just to be, I'm being honest, okay? You, you know, may not like my terminology, but I'm only 11, so. And I wanted to take the Lord's Supper, because every time I pass it, I was not taking it. You know what I mean? So I kind of wanted to be a part. And then you kind of say, well, then what happened? Well, then I went, and I, in other words, at that point, there was nothing that really changed in my life. I, I mean, I didn't even identify any sins, and if I did, I probably would have said, that's just too fun to give up, right? I'm a kid, okay? I'm just having fun. Now, you may say I was very immature. I'll grant that to you. I, I got it, right? But I was not there yet, not ready for that type of decision. So, and certainly kids can be much younger than that prepared and ready to make a decision, okay? So I'm not trying to say, I'm not trying to compare myself with you. I'm just trying to say this is where I'm at. When I was about 15 years old, I took reading the Bible very seriously, read it a lot, studied a lot. When I was 16, I decided to want to, I wanted to work in the church. I wanted to be in the ministry. I wanted, back then I probably was more interested in being a youth minister than I was about being a preacher. So I was kind of really committed, really serious, did mission trips, did ministry, did teaching, did preaching, involved in the church, you know, serving, all that stuff. When I was about 18, someone said, well, look at Romans chapter 6. Do you see what it's saying there? And I looked and said, yeah. And he said, well, what was it like when you got baptized? No, like that. When I was baptized into his death. I died when I was baptized. I, I gave up my life when I was baptized so I could live for Jesus. That wasn't me. So in other words, I, I was baptized, but I never really repented. I was baptized, never made Jesus Lord. So, at that point, like 18 years old, I realized as I continued to study, I needed to be baptized again. Or, you know, I needed to make this right. I needed to get into a covenant with God where I'm actually saying, I'm committing my life to you. 
although I'd already committed my life to him just a couple years earlier. So I, you know, that's what I say. I was already in the ministry, working in the ministry. I was still in high school, but still wanting to. Actually, I, when that happened, I was in the first year of Bible college. So I went home, told my parents. Now, my parents were God seekers. And you know what they said? They said, you know, we've been studying that too. And so I was baptized with my parents. Both of them were baptized the same day I was, when I was 18. Because I wanted to make that commitment, just like it says, right? So that's my story of learning and growing and understanding what kind of commitment this is. Because when you're baptized, you're baptized into his death. That's going to make a big difference in your life about how you live today. Now, you can be baptized into his death, be committed, be serious, and then you can drift away, you can become lukewarm, maybe you can even fall away. You know, there's all kinds of things that could happen that's not good, it's not being faithful to the vows you made when you became a Christian and when you were baptized. Now, when you come back, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean every time you come back, you've got to be baptized again and again and again. You get baptized right the first time, you just repent and come back. Does that make sense? So I'm, I'm not saying it's... I'm not saying I became a committed Christian when I was, you know, 10 or 11 years old. It's like I never became a committed Christian until I was 18. So that's, that's the difference. I don't want to confuse everybody and go, oh, is he saying that I should be baptized? You know, you've you got to kind of work that out with Jesus. If you want someone to talk to you, you can talk to myself or one of the elders or a friend or somebody that you trust. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the idea, though. What about us as Christians? Is this what our life looks like? Or have we kind of resurrected the old person, the old man, the old attitudes, the old way of life? You know, and then, and if, if you have what he's, that's what he's saying to them, just, you got to recommit. you got to say, those vows I took of dying to myself are serious, and I'm going to stick with it. So listen, we're buried with Jesus. We're buried with him by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, we too may walk in the newness of life. So when we're baptized, not only do we die to ourselves, but it's saying we come up out of a grave, a watery grave. And now we walk in new life. It's reenacting the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. We, too, participate in that. So think about what he's saying here, though. We got the dying to self part, but look what it says. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Just as. So how was Jesus raised from the dead? By the power of God. How was Jesus raised from the dead? To never die again. How was Jesus raised from the dead? With all power. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Through the, through, through the power of the promise of God. Through the power of resurrection. Like That's a lot of power, isn't it? Same power you can have. Same power God gave you when we... Does that say that? The same power, the same glory so that we can walk a new life. So we're not walking a new life all on our own. God is working in us and through us. And the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that's actually Ephesians chapter 1 in great detail. Ephesians 1, the power that raised Jesus from the dead is a power that works in your life. Same spirit, same power. So this is God working in us. Colossians chapter 2 explains this a little bit more. Having been buried with Jesus in baptism. So we know Jesus died and he was buried. We're buried. How are we buried? In a watery grave in which you also were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead and you 
who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all of our trespasses. Trespasses, another word for sins. All of our sins have been forgiven. When did that happen? When we were buried with Christ in baptism. So again, this is not teaching someone how to become a Christian. This is saying, you remember? That's what he's doing. He's reminding them. You remember when you were baptized? What that was for and what happened? How God was working? How you, how you became a new person? So what does that mean? It changes everything. And sometimes we have to be reminded of how God has worked and how God continues to work in our life through the power of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 4, Paul says, you know, I, I came and I preached to you what is foremost, the, the first importance, the primary teaching. This is it. That Christ died. He was buried. And he rose again. That's what Paul preached. The death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. That's what it looks like. But you see, Paul, through his letters, are teaching this. Yes, Christ died. That's the gospel. What does that mean for us today? Jesus died, buried, raised again. What it means for us is that we join Christ. Just as he died, we die to ourself. We repent. We turn away from everything that's ungodly and unholy. We humble ourselves before God. And we say, I want you in my life. I want to commit my life. I want to make Jesus the Lord, the King, the ruler, the master of my life. And I'm willing to submit to him, humble myself before him, serve him, follow him, listen to him. I want to obey him. I want to do it all to bring glory to the Father. I want to do it for the kingdom of God. I want to do it because God has loved me. So we die to ourselves, but then we're buried with Christ. Buried with Christ. Just as he was put in a tomb, we are put in a watery tomb. Buried with Christ. But you know, Christ didn't stay in the tomb. And we don't stay in the watery grave. As a matter of fact, it's not even recommended staying in the watery grave for three days. But he was buried. And we are buried. That's what we're, these are the words we're using. Buried with Christ. Well, then what happens? Well, Christ was raised from the dead. We, too, are raised with Christ to live a new life. So Paul says, I preach the gospel, death, burial, resurrection of Christ. Well, someone says, well, what do I need to do in order to become a Christian? Well, you just need to die to yourself. You need to be buried. And you need to be rise, risen up out of the grave of water to walk a brand new life. And so for us, it's a reminder of what we've already done. And hopefully, maybe just coming to worship every week and coming to Bible study and, and, and reading the Bible and maybe having devotionals at home with our family or children and the Lord's Supper, a continual reminder of saying, don't forget the commitment. Don't forget your covenant. Don't forget your relationship. Don't forget the promises. Don't forget what you said the day you said I do to Jesus. I will to Jesus. I am to Jesus. Don't forget that. Because that's who you are. It's made you into a new person. And you're no longer a part of all the things of the world anymore. And people say, yeah, you are quite different. Yeah, we are quite different. You know, sometimes that even happens when you actually get married, doesn't it? Maybe you just can't do all the things you used to do anymore. And maybe, depending on how old you were when you got married, but if you were kind of younger, and a lot of your friends maybe weren't married. And what do they say? Oh, you're a lot different now you're married. You're not as fun as you used to be. You're not as free as you used to be. You know? It's like, you got that right. It's the way it is. And there's two ways to go about it, isn't there? You know, one way is like, yeah, you better think twice about getting married too. Well, that doesn't sound very good. Or it's like, man, I wouldn't have it any other way. My wife's a whole lot better than you guys have ever been. 
right? I mean, she's just amazing. Like, marriage is wonderful. I mean, you really ought to just do it, you know? Like, like that's the thing. And that's the thing about being a Christian. It's not like, oh, I've got to go to church again, or i got to serve Jesus, or I can't go up partying with my friends and doing all that stuff I used to do. That's, 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 not, what a Christ, that's not what a Christian walk is about. If you're living that way, you, you've forgotten the, the pledge. You forgot what God has done. You forgot what the promises are. But being a Christian is saying, I'm so glad I'm not into that anymore, and i got something so much better to live for. As a matter of fact, I'm so excited about it. I'd like to tell some other people, right? It's not hard telling people good news. It's not hard telling people exciting things that are happening in your life. That's, that's what being a Christian is. Telling people the difference that God has made in our life and now we have a new life to live by the power of God and for his glory. So we offer an invitation. Usually we try to offer an invitation to everybody. And there's people here that said, yeah, I, I, I made that commitment when I was young and, you know, maybe I've kind of strayed away from my commitment. And maybe I need the encouragement and the prayers and the help of the church to say, you know, I, I need to get back into being serious about this thing. Or maybe you've never made the commitment to follow Christ. And perhaps today it's maybe as clear as can be. There's, there's more, a little more information. You kind of say, well, what does that mean living for Christ? And, you know, that type of thing. But maybe you're ready to, today to say, I'm ready to be baptized into Christ. I mean, this is serious business. To make that commitment to say, I'm ready to die to me, to live for Jesus. I'm ready to make that step. If we can encourage you, if we can be a blessing, if we can pray with you, we always give an opportunity. Let's stand. We'll sing the song, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. If we can encourage you, let us know.